Okay, so we should back door. Okay, let's get this running. All right, so good morning. Thank you for making it so early. I appreciate normally for our industry, we're normally still out at this time or just getting to bed. So thank you for waking up so early and being here with me. Uh, my name's Paul Nolan and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through a bit of a sound design masterclass. Now I did two very similar masterclasses yesterday and I live streamed those on my Facebook page which is what I'm doing right now. So afterwards you'll be able to watch these back on my Facebook page if you find it. It's uh, facebook.com slash Paul Nolan official. And what I did in those um, masterclasses was I looked at just generally getting a techno sound that you know works well with the levels of you know production quality that we are working with in the industry right now and also a bit more of a, uh, a an experimental sound design technique uh, to do with drones and all sorts of other interesting stuff. Now today in both masterclasses I thought I'd bring it back down to the classics so to speak and one of the things that I am relatively well known for is my 2015 dance fair masterclass on how to get a sound that is reminiscent or similar to what's been released on drum code which obviously as we know is you know one of the top labels in the world if not the top label in techno at the moment so i kind of wanted to go back to that a little bit and maybe break down and analyze some sounds from a recent drum code release and i was kind of in my hotel room last night um, in between watching my, my mighty Liverpool destroy West Ham 4-1, had to get that in there, um, and thinking, well, what, what can I, what can I do? And um, I found this recent release from uh, a producer who I've, I've admired for a long time, a guy called Julian Jewel, and ironically, it just happens to be on drum code, and it's called South, and I really liked just the overall movement of the sound of the track and the the whole groove of it so i thought i'd play a section of that to start off with to give you an idea about where the the level is and it's it's good because it's kind of a different it's like a different sound for drum colors i actually think it's a little more housey than the recent stuff which is honestly a lot more aggressive um, when you contrast it to releases from the likes of Alan Fitzpatrick and Leighton Giordani and some of the other guys you've had on there, Enrico San Giuliano, people like that. And, you know, it's a nice kind of change of pace. So it makes for a good example here because it shows drum code having a little bit of range in their releases. But also as well, there's some beautiful sound design going on here. And this is another strategy that I use where sound design is concerned. And it's an important point to start off with that I'm not looking to completely duplicate this track. I mean, there's been enough controversy in recent days of, of what I've seen on my social networks of artists being accused of ripping off other artists and stuff like that. And there's a very big difference between doing a flat copy of a track a complete duplication and using a reference track in a very inspirational way, okay? So I just wanna make that very clear that when I use reference tracks and when I work with my clients and we use reference tracks to identify where the level is or the type of sound that a client would like to achieve or an artist would like to achieve, it's very much done for inspiration. So it gives us a, a guide, it gives us a, a, a signpost towards, towards where we'd like to be rather than let's just do a, a rip-off version of whatever this this track is. So we're gonna to listen to this for a second and we're gonna make a note of some of the sounds and I wanna really break down, particularly the bass sound and how I've built it 
to be similar and to take inspiration from it, but to also put my own spin on it. And one or two would do the little sounds that are, that are around. So this is gonna be very focused on bass, on certain effects that we can achieve as well. And then we'll focus on you know how the whole thing kind of comes together. So let's have a little listen to it. I'll just start it around about bar set the table. on the, um, the main sort of bass line. But what I'll do is, I'll first of all, just play you my interpretation of that. And you'll hear there's some pretty significant differences and the feel of it is quite, is quite different. So again, this is a really good example of, of how I would work, where again, I'm using this reference track as a way of guiding me towards where I would like to be. And I'm a massive, massive fan of using reference tracks. And again, it's meant as a compliment to the original artist. I use reference tracks quite a lot for arrangement as well, which is an incredibly useful tool for making sure that you can structure your musical ideas in a way that that really, really works. And it helps you get to the finish line a lot quicker. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So the first thing I'm going to do is just going to solo this channel that I've got here, this dual bass. And as you'll see, I've actually got a, 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 an instrument rack here, which I've built from scratch. So again, just to give you an idea of what my sound design workflow is, um, my kind of approach and opinion on sound design is that it's 50% organization and then 50% actually what you do with the sound. So a sound is quite frankly useless unless you can place your hand on it at any moment that you need it. My main focus when I work on my own material and also when I work with clients and I help develop their artistic sound is to try and cut the time down from when they or I get the idea in my head. I want it to be instantly made real. And workflow and optimizing your workflow and organization is a massive part of that. And it's, it goes against that cliche of like, you know, oh, an artist wants to be really disorganized and there's chaos everywhere, but that's part of the creativity. I'll be honest with you, I think that's complete bullshit. It's utter bullshit because the artists that I often work with the most, who are the most organized, 
are often the most creative and they're the ones who can really move very quickly to create the vision that they have in their minds made real within the confines of the software and obviously you know they manifest it into reality when they play their music out so in terms of how i kind of work everything goes into especially in ableton it goes into instrument racks everything has macros assigned because i'm a very big user of push to back in my studio in liverpool in the uk and um, the great thing about having a macro set up like this is that it allows me instant access on the push control to the most important aspects so again it gets me to a situation where i don't even have to think i just do it so again what i'll do is in terms of how i create these sounds is i give myself dedicated time to actually work on this level and be able to create these sounds away from the confines of having to you know work on on actually finishing tracks so then they become integrated into whatever creative ideas i have so what i'll do is uh, it's a very simple rack it's just an eq8 and also filter and a kickstart with a side of and that can literally be it that can be the sound it doesn't have to have lots and lots of complicated processes as long as the sound itself does its job really well then that's what it's there to do and that's totally fine so if i just play this bass you can hear it's again i've, I've put a slightly different twist on the, the, the actual reference bass if i just play the same clip here it's a very simple it couldn't be more simple really it's just a 60 note arpeggio with just one no, it's not even, it's one semitone, and it just gives you that movement. So if I go into silence here, let me just stop that for a second. What I might do is I might just change that skin, because not a lot of people like that skin, but I love it. Okay, so obviously silence, it's a classic, you know, it's one of the industry standards since. Um, I was having a discussion with somebody yesterday about it actually and um, this is great if you need that kind of slightly analogue sound but it's also a very accurate synth so it's very different from other emulations of analogue synths in that it's actually quite tight in terms of its pitching in terms of the positioning of the various parameters it doesn't like drift, it doesn't slew. Like say for example, if you were to compare this to like an Artorian Mini V, which is obviously a very faithful emulation of a, a Moog Model D, you know, it's even got like the fact that the third oscillator slides slightly out of pitch in, you know, in, in the own times. And that's great if you want that really kind of like slightly sloppy analog sound. But if I want something a bit more accurate, but to still have that analog style quality, silent is perfect for that. So there's still a very, very big uh, role to play for silent, even though it has largely remained unchanged over the years. It's not really, you know, added a lot of new features and the sound of it has kind of improved gradually. But it, again, it's still that same great dependable synth. It's a real workhorse, as they like to say. So I'm going to break this sound down a little bit and how I've kind of made it. And the whole idea is to obviously go through it oscillator by oscillator. So my workflow where synthesis is concerned is consistent no matter what. I always work the same way in the same order no matter what sound I'm trying to create. So for me, it first of all starts obviously with the sound source, it starts with the oscillator. So mostly as you'll see in both parts A and B, as you silent users will know, it's effectively two synthesizers in one. And I always start with picking the right kind of oscillator. And again, what I like to do with silent is a lot of the time I like to keep the voice counts quite low, because I find if you get up above like four voices per oscillator it tends to start getting a bit too thick because you want it to be big you want it to be fat sounding but there's a limit to that where it starts to take up too much space and it starts to overwhelm particularly if you're doing basses with sound 
it starts to overwhelm the kick drum and it starts to muddy things up. So I like to keep things to one or two voices maximum. Um, the whole idea, as I say, is to start with, I normally work with sort of two ways with this type of sound. And then once I've gotten the sound exactly where I want it, so again, it's a sawtooth wave, one octave below the root note, which is F sharp. And if I was to just play this again, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn part B off, and then I'm actually going to turn the volume of A2 down. So it's literally just this really low ripple. So one of the other things I like to do is turn that sound off there. I'll just start with the filters all the way up so I can actually hear what's going on. So again, there's only two voices here, which means there's two sources waves stacked on top of each other, and then a very slight detuning. So for those of you who don't understand what detuning is, it's taking both of these sources waves and slightly offsetting the pitch against one another. So they deliberately phase, so you get periods where they interact with each other in a negative way, so they actually diminish each other's output and then in other areas they'll really combine constructively and then enhance each other's output so you get this nice little slide you get this nice kind of you know uh, wider kind of sound so that's just bubbling away nicely and for me i'm already thinking i've got one eye on Right, well, where can the sound go? Where's the limit for this sound? What happens if I throw the filters all the way up? So again, it's about almost starting at the peak, at the top of the mountain for this sound, the maximum of its capability, and then almost like drawing it back down to that most basic thing, which is it just bubbling away in the background of the cutoff, all the way down. I mean, even there, if I just play that with just the kick drum only, that's still going to play a role, and that's just one. See, it's still bubbling away really nicely. Okay, so we go back to sound, and then I'll just add in again. on a sorted way but again an octave up so effectively it's playing the chord right now i'm playing f sharp and again it's playing an oscillator a1 an octave below so f sharp say one and then f sharp three above that so effectively we're getting multiples of the waveform to kind of give it that really, really thick kind of very full kind of sound which again will trigger other elements as we start getting into how to build tension with this particular sound and keep it moving through the track. The next thing is actually the amplitude envelope. So I go oscillator to get the right kind of sound, the right kind of texture of you know raw sound and then from there I go into the amplitude envelope to make sure that the actual um, the time of the sound is right, the actual the way it, it fades out over time, the way it travels in terms of volume. So again, a lot of sustain here, if I was to just play, you know, just some random notes on a keyboard here. I'm just really on that. It's just a very, it's actually just a very short kind of style. Which just allows for it to kind of move very nicely. So to go through this, I actually have got a modulator here, an envelope, which will control how quickly or how slowly the cutoff will open up automatically every time silence receives a note. So again, it's got a very short decay here, which allows for that pluckiness to come through. Now if I was to just flatten that out, 
It doesn't quite move in the same way. But if I add an amount here, that pluckiness comes through and I can keep it round and keep it warm. And it allows it to kind of, again, rhythmically propel this track forward. So if I go over into part B now, Setup. It's another sorted wave on oscillator B1. Again, not very much going on in terms of DTU because there's only one voice. And then the, the critical one is actually what gives it that kind of subby kind of quality, which is an octave down into sine wave. So again, it's added almost like in other types of synths, you have like what's called a sub oscillator, which will give you a sine wave one octave below what the you know the root notes or the root of the oscillators is playing. So if I was to then just combine the two again it just gives you that overall now what I always like to say about design sounds such as this is that half the battle is actually the raw sound. The other half of the battle is what you do with that sound when you have it. So to give you an idea of the process in here, again, it's very, very simple because I want to keep this sound quite clean. But again, I, what I do with it in terms of insert effects on the actual channel itself is going to be slightly different to what I do with it on, say for example, the send and return channels, which we're going to get into in a moment. So, very simply, just a little bit of high pass filter, and this is purely to just clean the bottom end up, tighten it up a little bit, and then make more room for that kick drum to come through, which is punching through really well. And again, you don't necessarily hear a difference, but you would feel that. And again, it clears just that little bit of space in order to allow the kick drum to really come through. Now, the next element is an auto filter. So this can be useful to have a secondary filter, uh, as well as the actual filter on silent itself. Because again, if I turn the silent filter all the way down on our Mac Pro here, see I've still got a little bit of that top end coming through. But I can actually then effectively just turn it into like a, a subline using the auto filter. more control so I can then manage the transition of this sound in and out of the arrangements using potentially just the auto filter and again my love of the auto filter is uh, manifesting itself again through the fact that I love to use this MS2 filter circuit and I like to add a little bit of drive to it. For those of you who are not familiar MS2 actually is it's the low pass filter circuit from a Korg MS20 that I have actually emulated for the purposes of the auto filter. And again, you've got various different circuits here, including just the clean normal circuit, various different parameters you can use here. Uh, and, and the other one that I really prefer is PRD, which is actually from Moog as well. It's a Moog low pass filter circuit, which is quite nice. So there's plenty of things you can do with this. And also as well, it, it, it sort of integrates another little trick that you can use as well, where a lot of people don't realise this, but one thing you can do is if I was to just unmap this from the Mac Pro here, so you can just see the LPF just got a bit dead there, you can actually map more than one control to a macro. You can actually have multiple elements set to one macro, and this can produce some really interesting results. So say for example, if I was to map it to the same macro, so the filter cutoff of the auto filter is going to the silent filter macro. Now what you'll see if I open up silent, and if I just make it a little bit smaller so we can see both, 
I can now move the filter control cut off and the auto filter cut off at the same time using one macro. So it can actually produce some really interesting. Obviously in this situation, they're kind of both doing the same job. But if I was to flip that to a high pass filter, interesting and quite useful as a layer if you were to layer that sound up. So to give you an idea, we would command D, control D on PC, you would completely duplicate that sound. But what I would do in this situation is I would actually have it in its normal situation, like so. And if we just play that sound, this duplicate. idea from the Julian Jewel wheel track and now we're starting to take it in our own direction. So my whole idea when I work with reference tracks like this is again not complete imitation as I've said a couple of times already but it's actually I want to get to about 75 to 80 percent of what this sounds do to get me into the ballpark. Then from there it's like right where else can I take it? How can I enhance what's come before? How do I put my own unique sound and own unique spin on it? So I can actually now start to, you know, become known for this being my signature sound rather than effectively just duplicating what's already out there. So it's about, again, the nature of creativity in general is taking inspiration from the world around you and then being able to do your own unique version of it. So. The best artists do that, but then they take it a mile further. They go, you know, further and further to try and, you know, expand what's possible. So even going further into this, we take our sound that we've kind of done a top and a bottom end of now. Let's take that back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the actual filter mode now to, it's a real favourite of mine, this. It's known as, the, it's like a multi-filter, it's like a multi-mode filter. Um, if I was to unmap the cutoff here, I'm going to put this right in the middle, and then I'm going to take this morph control on the auto filter, and I'm going to take it to the silent filter macro. And what you can see when I'm moving this around here is effectively, it's just morphing in between all the different filter modes. So at 100, you've got a classic low pass. Somewhere in the middle, you've got a bang reject or a notch filter. And then here, you've got more of a high pass. And then more towards the bottom, it goes into a bang pass. And then again, back into a low. So you can see it's got quite an interesting travel. Now, if I was to map that to the silent filter, we'll start to get some really interesting movement here. So, is I really love some of the really simple Max for Live plugins that we get within Ableton. 
Uh, again, one of the great things about Live 10 when it finally drops is that Max for Live will be completely integrated into Ableton. So you'll get more of an opportunity to use these types of tools. And one of the ones I really like is one of the simplest ones. It's actually an LFO. And what I like about this LFO is that it kind of decouples the concept of a low frequency oscillator and it, from a synthesizer or a sampler and then allows you to map this to any parameter. So you can just see it oscillating away, cycling away, waiting to be mapped. So if I was to map this now by clicking the map button, I can then decide just by clicking on whatever parameter I want what I want to do. And as you can see, now it's kind of just automatically going mental. So from here, I can then change it to a sync. And again, that stops the oscillator from playing but that's because it's not in actual play mode. And again, because now I've got the sound filter independent again, serious with some sound effects as well. So what I've got here is, again, for those of you who may have caught yesterday's masterclass, this might be familiar to you. This is like my, as it says here, my stock reverb. I tend to use this less as a, a traditional reverb. I tend to use it more like a riser to add tension. So now I've got the, the higher, I just give that a slightly different colour so we know exactly what we're dealing with here. Let's make that yellow colour. So it's higher. So effectively, this is now working on the top end of this sort of whole base concept. So this frees me up to be able to send things to effects that I wouldn't normally be able to do, like reverbs, for example. So if I was to send some of this top layer to a reverb, makes it so much more interesting and then you can really start to feel like you've got so many more creative options and places to go in the context of a final arrangement. So that's just one of the sound effects and again in terms of how I use various different effects, the ones that I'm going to really zone in on here, uh, the actual one I'm really going to go into here is H-Delay. Now this is a Waves plugin and honestly, one of probably my favourite effects plugins in the last couple of years. And you know, it's been around for a while and it, it does its thing really well. And I absolutely love what it does and the functionality that it gives you. So, 
I want to spend a little bit of time just sort of discussing hate delay and how it can work in the context of sound design. Especially with this sort of top end sound, because it's going to give us some really, really interesting elements. So, if I was to just send on turn two here, let me just solo that. You can just hear that delay, delay in the background. If I was to just solo just the hate delay for a second, so we can hear it a bit better. So you can see I've got this set to an eighth dotted delay. So it gives us a nice rhythm. Again, if I was to just throw the kick in a little bit, you'll hear it. Okay. But what I really like about it is the potential to change this setup and create some really, really big feedbacks and modulations that really enhance the track in terms of the tension that we try to build in this type of record. So one of the things I can do is I can actually change this from being synced to the host, meaning 125 BPM, and again it's showing an 8 dotted delay. But that also is represented and can be represented in a different unit of measurement for time. Because if you think about it, 125 beats per minute is a bit like saying I'm traveling 70 kilometers per hour in a car. It's just a unit of measurement. And we can convert that into milliseconds because again, you have a thousand milliseconds in one second, 60,000 milliseconds in one minute. And back in the days before we had very convenient note syncing possibilities in, you know, um, like digital delays and plugins of this type, we had to work out manually what the delay times actually were. We had to either do that by ear or do a basic calculation to actually put the right numbers and the right measurements in. So how do we do that? Well, forgive me for one second while I bring the calculator out. And that's probably not what you've come here to see on a Sunday morning. Somebody from England doing maths in front of you, but bear with me, it'll be over soon. So basically, as I say, you take the fact that you've got a thousand milliseconds in one second, you obviously multiply that by 60 seconds, you get 60,000, right? So that's 60,000 milliseconds per minute. So now we've got an equality really between 125 beats a minute and 60,000 milliseconds. So what we do is, is that we take that 60,000 and we divide it by the BPM. So that's actually a quarter note delay, 480. Now if we want an eighth note delay, just divide it by two. One sixteenth, divide it by two. One thirty second, divide it by two. Simple. So you can start to actually do some really interesting things with this knowledge because what you can actually do is then maybe slightly offset the delay time to almost syncopate the delay and almost give it like a groove. And you get these little groove functions on some delays, and that can be quite useful. That's effectively what it's doing. But if I was to take this sound and combine changes over time with a delay time with increases in feedback, I'm going to start getting into some really, really interesting situations. So if I push this feedback, you'll start to really hear this push forward. And that on its own will provide a lot of tension. It's kind of an old school 
kind of take on delay where it associates the pitch of the delay with the delay time. And then combining with the fact that you can actually go to 200% feedback. So again, the feedback is taking the output of the delay and then rooting it straight back in in a nice neat loop. And again, you've got these other options like you can hit a lo-fi button and it really makes it quite scuzzy. You can phase reverse the left or the right side. I like the ping pong mode quite a lot. And another thing I quite like to do in this situation is I like to use sends on sends. So what you'll see if I just expand the send view here a little bit in Ableton, you'll see the vast majority of them are always by default deactivated. This is to stop you from feeding back on yourself. When, say for example, if you were to, you know, root something to return C and then send out on C, back to C, then, you know, trust me, I've done it. It's very, very, very painful, especially when you've got headphones on, not nice. Either do it at low volume or use a limiter, just for safety's sake. So don't anybody come to me saying, I ah, damaged your ears, because I'm, you know, disclaiming myself illegally right now. Um, so basically, what I've done now is I've activated, you can right click and you can enable the sense. So what I like to do is, is actually to add extra drama. I like to take the output of the H delay and then I send it to the reverb on it. starting to cross-reference your different sound effects in order to produce a hell of a lot of tension, a lot of interest, and a lot more creative possibilities that are very easily controlled just by automating sounds. And again, you've got that capacity. I'm just sending the top layer. If you look at it, I'm actually only sending, you know, one thing really that we've got activated to that delay. So if we start getting into combining different things together, like, you know, sending part of the drums, to the returns and stuff, you've got a huge amount of possibility and you can start to really combine them in interesting ways to, to really get yourself into some unique territory. So what we've done just in closing is taken inspiration from a very, very high level producer and then we've taken that concept and then we've run with it in a direction that we want to go in. I think that's the most important takeaway from this. And again, we can start to really, you know, look at some of the other you know, elements that we can do in terms of layering, intelligent use of effects and modulations, again, specifically using Max for Live, and then obviously racking these things together, being able to save them in our own unique library of sounds. So one of the things I'd like to say in closing is, the sound of like Paul Nolan as a producer lives in these folders. And when you start to create sounds like this, and then you actually go, right, well, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna save this into my base folder. Because you've got all these different sounds that are living together, you start to interact with them in different ways. And I start to put, say for example, this bass rack together in a unique way with some drum racks that I've built. Which means that all of a sudden you can start to interchange all of your different creations on a sound design level and you start to get into an infinite level of possibility for being able to take bass sounds that you might have used before, drum racks have used before, and then unique combinations create unique tracks. So it really allows you to leverage and make the most out of what you're creating as a sound designer, as well as a producer, as well as an artist. So really take some time to devote yourself to sound design because it really is the number one way that you will create a unique sound for yourself. 
So thank you for your time. Really appreciate you guys making the effort this early on a Sunday morning. And um, one thing I did want to mention before we finish is a lot of what I've covered today uh, is expanded upon in an online course that I've developed, uh, which is called Finish More Music. And it's the number one thing that I see people struggle with all the time, is people getting their tracks to the right level and getting it finished. Because I'm sure I can speak for a lot of people in this room that we've got a lot of projects probably sitting on our hard drives that we're either struggling to finish, we're frustrated with, or we don't know how to get them to the finish line. This course that I've developed is the result of 10 years of me teaching people how to do that. So it'd be great if you guys could take a look at that. My website is transition.studio and what I've got with me here, I've actually got some discount codes for 50% off. I don't know if some of you guys got them yesterday, but if the guys are here today want to take one, I've got a few here left. And yes, I would uh, love to answer your questions afterwards as well. So thank you very much for your time and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.